Okay, this video is called Ayn Rand, um, Art Hero Number One. Ayn Rand is what I would call a Christian atheist, and that sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. Uh, we're mostly going by this book here, um, Ayn Rand, The Romantic Manifesto. It's her book about what is the summary of her artistic work, what is her uh, theory of art in general. And, you know, she's the smartest woman who ever lived. It's you almost always learn something useful when you read her stuff. And I know lots of people hate her, but that's because she's a strongly opinionated genius, okay? People hate geniuses. That's pretty normal, especially a woman genius is going to get hated even more because people have an expectation of how a woman should talk and behave and whatnot. Um, this book, Romantic Manifesto, was written in 1969. Well, it's copyrighted for 1969. It was actually originally written in 1962. Okay, and she was a tremendous fan of Victor Hugo from the mid-1800s and Dostoevsky from the later 1800s. And she felt this was the greatest artistic achievement that mankind had ever achieved in literature. And she felt that it was slipping away from the modern world, people's awareness of it, that people were turning into just ignorant barbarians and losing connection to their past culture, which diminished them. Okay, so for, here's the first quote of Ayn Rand. I am a bridge between the aesthetic achievements of the 19th century and the minds that choose to discover them. It is impossible for the young people of today to grasp the reality of man's higher potential and what scale of achievement it had reached. But I have seen it. I know that it was real, that it existed, that it is possible. It is that knowledge I want to hold up to the sight of men over a brief span of less than a century before the barbarian curtain descends altogether, if it does, and the last memory of man's greatness vanishes into another dark ages. And that's highly relevant. I mean, any intelligent person can nowadays sense that we feel we're kind of heading into dark ages, okay? Progressively worsening censorship, uh, progressively more vulgar popular culture. Um, so these are real issues, okay? Next quote of Ayn Rand. Art is a concretization of metaphysics. So it takes some abstract concept and makes it into something concrete. Like, for example, look at Michelangelo's painting of the creation of Adam. You take the idea of man created an image of God and you make it into something concrete. That's what art does. It solidifies a picture of a metaphysic concept, philosophical concept, into something concrete. Uh, and that's probably the most important painting ever made. Um, Ayn Rand continues, art brings man's concepts to the perceptual level of his consciousness. Art converts the metaphysical abstraction into a concrete. Art is indispensable for the communication of a moral ideal. Ayn Rand. So that would also be analogous to a person sees somebody who has made great achievements in their field of interest. For example, a young boy will see Hank Williams Sr. or Johnny Cash in country music and they say, gee, that's what I perceive to be greatness. I would like to someday be like that. And that picture in their mind of that great role model for them inspires them to work hard and to put up with all the drudgery and sadness of their own life. Okay, Ayn Rand continues. In order for a man to, a man to live, he must act. In order to act, he must make choices. In order to make choices, he must define a code of values. In order to define a code of values, he must know what he is and where he is. In other words, he must know his own nature and that of the universe in which he acts. In other words, he needs philosophy. That's a key point. He needs philosophy. He cannot escape from this need. His only alternative is whether the philosophy guiding him is to be chosen by his own mind or by chance. So most people do not intellectually create their own sophisticated set of value judgments and aesthetics. They sort of just take upon them whatever's normal for the society around them. But when a person does that, they become conformist and dull, okay? Any intelligent person will have a more sophisticated shaping of their worldview and what they value and don't value. And it's important to help a person intellectually develop, like a young person, for example, that they think about all these things. So, Ayn Rand continues, I love the work of Victor Hugo in a deeper sense than the admiration for his superlative literary genius. 
and I find many similarities between his sense of life and mine, although I disagree with virtually all of his explicit uh, psychology. I like Dostoevsky for his superb mastery of plot structure and for his merciless dissection of the psychology of evil. Even though his philosophy and his sense of life are diametrically opposed to mine, I cannot stand Tolstoy. His sense of life is not merely mistaken, but evil. Hugo gives me the feeling of entering a cathedral. Okay, now this is what I think is funny about Ayn Rand. Okay, she's this brilliant genius, and she'll tell you that she's an atheist, but what does she love and always praise? You know, the greatest Christian authors of all time. So I find that rather funny. You know, look at Les Miserables. What is that all about? The bishop forgives Jean Valjean, which then enables him to go and do all these wonderful things to help so many people, okay? Um, look at Dostoevsky. What is he but the greatest Christian writer ever with the best book ever, Brothers Karamazov. These are like the greatest novels of all time, Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky and Les Miserables by uh, Victor Hugo. Okay, um, now uh, Ayn Rand continues. The integration of an important theme with a complex plot structure is the most difficult achievement possible to a writer and the rarest. Its great masters are Victor Hugo and Dostoevsky. If you wish to see literary art at its highest, study the manner in which the events of their novels proceed from, express, illustrate, and dramatize their themes. The integration is so perfect that no other events have conveyed, could have conveyed the theme. Yeah, if you want to learn about writing a novel, I mean, Victor Hugo and Dostoevsky are like the two best that ever lived, and I think Charles Dickens is up there with Christmas Carol. Um, let's see. For just for pure entertainment value, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, even though there's a lot of BS in that novel, it's incredibly well written. Okay. Um, Ayn Rand continues, Romanticism is a product of the 19th century, a largely subconscious result of two great influences, Aristotelianism, which liberated man by validating the power of his mind, and Capitalism, which gave man's mind the freedom to translate his ideas into practice. So what does that mean? What she's basically saying is Aristotle had, you know, given testimony to the idea of we can perceive reality and we can be uh, accurate and life has meaning and we can understand it. Like Aristotle was largely a biologist and that's all wonderful in comparison with Plato. Plato was a little bit pie in the sky, mysticism and Aristotle, you know, in my opinion as well as Ayn Rand, he's the greatest philosopher who ever lived, perhaps the smartest man who ever lived, maybe Isaac Newton and there's some others that are up there. But, and I think when she says Aristotelianism, she's almost saying like Christianity as well or Judeo-Christianity, that idea of the value of man's mind in comparison with saying, oh, we can never understand anything. If you start talking like that, or life has no meaning, then, then you really become stupid and you can't understand anything. So it's important to, to value the ability of man's mind to observe, to analyze correctly, to reason. Okay, and then capitalism is the only economic system that works. If you really study it, you'll see that everything else is sort of BS, laissez-faire capitalism. Okay, um, Ayn Rand continues. Among novelists, the greatest are Victor Hugo and Dostoevsky, and as single novels whose authors were not always consistent in the rest of their works, I would name uh, Henry Sienkiewicz, you know, the Polish author, Quo Vadis. Quo Vadis is when, you know, St. Peter was walking away from Rome, and then he saw the image of Jesus coming into Rome, and he said, where are you going? And then when he saw that, he turned around and went back, and it's a great book, great movie. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, sort of the masterpiece of the woman's scarlet print with the letter A for adultery on her, uh, on her sweater. But again, these are intensely Christian books, which again, I find funny that I read will say they're so great. And why do they tend to make great novels, great authors? Because it's the idea of redemption. It's, it's natural for humans to be fascinated by the con the concept of redemption. You know, one screws up in life, makes a mistake, and tries to make up for it. One fails or suffers or is set back in their quest of a goal, and then they learn to overcome their obstacles. You know, that inspires humankind. That's the natural thing for us to care about. Um, the distinguishing characteristic of this top rank, apart from the purely literary genius, 
is their full commitment to the premise of volition, meaning that a man can do things intentionally and be successful based on his reason and his effort. So we're not just victims of fate. That's sort of the key point there. These writers are enormously concerned with man's soul. They are moralists in the most profound sense of the word. Their characters are larger than life, motivated by their struggle in pursuit of spiritual goals. Notice how religious all this stuff is. And by profound value conflicts. If philosophical significance is a criterion of what is to be taken seriously, then these are the most serious writers in natural, in world literature, Ayn Rand. So some of the things we're getting there too is the concept of what is a man? If man is a creature created in the image of God and has a meaningful life, then things matter and every detail matters and he has volition. He can do things to make his life better. That's why we're interested in the book versus the, so the so-called naturalistic school of literature that, you know, man's just a talking primate and he has no real control of his own fate and things just happen to him and it's also oh sad, but this is just the way it is. It's better to be aware of it than, than unaware of it, but that's sort of a sad, pathetic, uh, almost meaningless existence. And that um, takes your power away. It's, 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 you know, despair. It's depressing. Okay, Ayn Rand continues. Philosophically, romanticism is a crusade to glorify man's existence. Psychologically, it is experienced simply as the desire to make life interesting. Okay? So there's a couple worldviews all tied up in this. There's a Judeo-Christian worldview, which we've alluded to. But there's also the worldview of the, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. The Aristotelian worldview, you know, that man can be heroic, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. You know, especially that idea more like of Odysseus. Modern art is the most eloquent demonstration of the cultural bankruptcy of our age. So she makes the point is that the art of the age reflects the society. And if you see crappy art, when modern art is all a big fake pile of junk, that really reflects poorly on our society. And that's why, you know, you know, you might be forced publicly to pretend you like modern art, but if you actually like it or praise it, you're really like insulting yourself. It's, it's crap, and you should be able to say that and know how to say it and say it. Because if you accept that, you'll only get tons more of it in society. And how depressing is that for a young person? You know, that's one thing I talked about earlier when I talked about like most modern buildings. They look like animal cages with a statue of a turd in front. That's not something to admire, and I don't care. You know, I think Picasso stinks. Okay, next quote of Ayn Rand. Art, including literature, is the barometer of a culture. It reflects the sum of society's deepest philosophical values. It's actual, it is the actual view of man and his existence. Romantic art is the fuel and the spark plug of a man's soul. Its task is to set a soul on fire and to never let it go out. The task of providing that fire with a motor and a direction belongs to philosophy. The distance between Victor Hugo's world and ours is astonishingly short. Astonishingly short. He died in 1885. But the distance between his universe and ours has to be measured in aesthetic light years. He is virtually unknown to the American public except for some vandalized remnants on our movie screens. His works are seldom discussed in their literary courses of our universities. He is invisible to the neo-barbarians of our age. Yet Victor Hugo is the greatest novelist of world literature. Romantic literature did not come into existence until the 19th century. When men's, and by the way, that's typical. The greatest author ever, and almost no one knows about him, okay? Just like you open up a medical textbook, there's no McDougal in there. There's no Esselstyn in there. There's no Ornish in there. There's no Kempner in there. There's nothing about Burkitt except for his Burkitt's lymphoma, nothing about his nutritional knowledge. So to find the best stuff in life, you got to search. It doesn't, it's not just handed to you, unfortunately. Okay, yet Victor Hugo was the greatest novelist of world literature. Um, it was a time when men's life was politically freer than in any other period of history and when Western culture was still reflecting a predominantly Aristotelian influence. You could easily substitute Christian influence for that. That was before the Nietzsche, God is dead stuff coming in the late 1800s. Okay, so she continues. The conviction that man's mind is competent to deal with reality. Modern readers, particularly the young, should be cautioned that a first encounter with Hugo might be shocking to them. It is like emerging from a murky underground 
filled with the moans of festering half-corpses into a blinding burst of sunlight. Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand continues, The motive and purpose of my writing is the projection of an ideal man, the portrayal of a moral ideal, as my ultimate literary goal as an, as an end in itself to which any didactic, intellectual, or philosophical values contained in a novel are only the means. So that was her goal always, to project what is the greatest man could be, man or woman could be, in a sense to give her reading audience a role model, a mentor for what they might strive to, to inspire them, because people need that. Rand continues, to improve any thing, one must know what constitutes an improvement, and to know that one must know what is the good, and to achieve it, and to know that one must have a whole system of value judgments. As far as literary schools are concerned, I would call myself a romantic realist. So she's a romantic realist, somebody who was in touch with reality, but emphasized the best aspect of it, the drama of it. Rand continues, it was Aristotle who said that fiction is of greater philosophical importance than history because history represents things only as they are, while fiction represents them as they might be and ought to be. Yeah, so Aristotle said fiction is more important because it gives people, the reader, an image of what things could be, what to aspire to. Okay, Rand continues, the primary value of art is that it gives man the experience of living in a world where things are as they ought to be. This experience is of crucial importance to him. It is his psychological lifeline. Yeah, that's why you should put pictures of your heroes or your favorite painting or the greatest uh, achievements in your own field of interest, you know, on your wall, say in your bathroom, because they inspire you. You see that every day, you know, and we're going to kind of get a, just a quick statement on like psychotherapy is people don't just need you know, some food, they also need to have meaning in their life. And that's sort of what she's saying here. This artistic meaning to aspire to energizes a person, motivates them, can inspire great achievement. Okay, Rand continues. The motive and purpose of my writing can best be summed up by saying that if a dedication page were to precede the total, the total of my work, it would read to the glory of man to the glory of man. And that's from this book, Ayn Rand's The Romantic Manifesto. So what she's basically saying, that was her whole entire goal, to show what mankind could be. You know, she was a little girl growing up in communist Russia. Her father's business was destroyed, and she was very sad and depressed, and the world was a pretty gloomy place. And then she read the novel of Victor Hugo, and she was so awestruck by it and inspired that it gave her hope. And that was her whole life to try to become a great writer like Victor Hugo. And she did. The greatest writer, the greatest female writer that ever lived, okay? The, you know, Atlas Shrugged is like one of the most incredible novels a person could ever read in their life. Uh, what I also find interesting here, she says, to the glory of man. And with her worldview, that's very similar to, to Bach saying, to the glory of God. Okay, when someone aspires something to a higher goal, they lift themselves up. Um, so, anyway, thought that was great. 